Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Brad Muscle, and welcome to episode 3 of Book Musings, where I take a look at Kurt Vonnegut and his Slaughterhouse 5, a classic, and for some reason I had never read anything by Kurt Vonnegut up until this point, even though, as I discovered when I went out and took all my Vonnegut books out of the library, I actually have quite a few of his books, and he's been recommended to me uh, throughout the years. So it was actually surprising then that it took me all this time to actually get around to reading one of his books. So um, again, we're going to turn our attention to Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. You know, a little bit about why I came to this book, at least now. So I already referenced the fact that, you know, I obviously have some of his books. He's been recommended to me. Um, you know, I've been an avid reader, as I've alluded to throughout you know, many of these episodes. Um, so no surprise that then I would come across Vonnegut, right? Um, you know, a, a, a classic, uh, a well-known um, American author at this point, you know, known for, for many of his works. I have them here, Breakfast of Champions, Cat's Cradle. Um, I actually have two copies of Slaughterhouse-Five, evidently. Um, but, you know, he's he's got many classics at this point. And um, so it's not a surprise that I would run into Slaughterhouse-Five uh, but, you know, why now? Uh, well, as I've also alluded to in other episodes, other videos, you know, other series, um, you know, I've been interested in philosophical ideas like time. For example, what was it, episode two of The Great Philosophical Abyss, where I go in and I discuss, you know, David Hume's skeptical arguments for why we ought to question our basic notion of time. And so I've always sort of found you know, those sorts of uh, discussions interesting. And I don't know what it was that initially got me on Vonnegut for whatever reason, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but for whatever reason, I got onto Vonnegut and I looked up Slaughterhouse Five, the Wikipedia article on it. Um, again, I don't know what it was initially, um, but then, you know, read through a sort of synopsis of it and the idea of death as well and how, um, you know, some cultures and the Tremophil Dorians the extraterrestrials uh, in the book, um, they have this sort of interesting view of death where they kind of minimize it. And so uh, that's been of particular interest to me, to me uh, lately as well, this idea of death. And what does this notion of death look like, especially if you take, you know, certain views, metaphysical views, right? If you're an idealist versus a, a materialist and so on. And in fact, I've been so interested in this sort of stuff uh, um, recommendation for any of you guys that are interested in similar things, you know, what exactly is death? You know, what does it look like, especially given what we are essentially, you know, we have to flesh out who or what it is we are essentially then to determine what it would amount to for that to end, right? Um, if you're interested in that sort of uh, philosophical stuff, check out Shelley Kagan, Professor Kagan from Yale University. I don't know how I got on this, that either. Maybe that's how somehow I got on the Vonnegut, but um, free lecture, the whole course, it's just called Death. He's a philosophy instructor at Yale, just called Death. Um, and fascinating. I think I'm on lecture 19 or video 19 out of like 25. So I've been watching these videos, uh, fascinating lecture. Kagan, Shelley Kagan is phenomenal. I guess uh, this lecture series, so it was put out, I want to say in 2007. So it was just made free, uh, publicly available by Yale. And it was so popular. It was like the most academic wise the most downloaded youtube series in like asia or like china or something like that i don't remember the particulars but it was extremely popular is the gist of it anyway i've been interested in a, i guess it's all peripheral but um interested in the same sort of stuff then that comes it up at least peripherally uh or on um it's at least i guess one of the things i'll point out is that um in terms of what's going on philosophically in here there's not a lot of depth you do get like tastes of these interesting ideas like death. You know, what does that exactly does that look like? And maybe our typical sense of time or how we think of time isn't exactly uh, maybe as I've mentioned in other episodes, as I've already intimated, right? Maybe it's not exactly as, as it seems to us typically. That's alluded to um, in this book, right? But I guess one of the things that'll come out is that I don't think that it, that it is treated that much in depth though. And um, again, that's I, one, one of the things I'll mention is that that's not necessarily 
uh, criticism or, or a positive, not necessarily positive or negative. It just depends on kind of what you're looking for. So I, I guess backing up, you know, what drew me to the book was that it actually, at least in some sense, dabbled in those kinds of issues or topics, right? So very interesting to me, uh, that general sort of uh, subject matter, especially lately, especially what I've been interested in in terms of these other episodes and series as I've, I've suggested. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the book itself and what's going on in the book. And basically the gist of the book, um, so other than the first and the last chapter, um, so I want to say there's 10 chapters, so the middle eight chapters chronicle uh, the plights of Billy Pilgrim, basically, is this the main character. Um, what I'll refer to as an anti-hero, I guess, that's what's, what um, such a character is referred to in the scholarship, typically. You know, they refer to such a character as an anti-hero, and Billy Pilgrim's a perfect example, as will become evident as I proceed here, of an anti, you know, perfect example of an anti-hero. Just very extremely downtrodden, um, you know, very, and I'll reference um, numerous quotes here to sort of solidify this, but um, very much a, a fatalist, you know, whatever happens, it's going to happen, what can we do about it, that sort of thing. And that is kind of the overarching, I, I guess, theme that I, you know, one takes away from, from this book really is that. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll reference numerous quotes to back that idea up, but that what's going to happen is going to happen, this idea of fatalism. So it documents uh, Pilgrim, Billy Pilgrim, right? This book does, for the most part, documents him and his, um, uh, basically his, for the most part, crappy life. Um, one sort of trial and tribulation after another, um, you know, and then basically it's just him sort of being... Oh, oh well, you know, like I said, he's a fatalist through and through. Um, lots of crap happens to him, and it, you know, it, I guess for better, really, it doesn't seem to phase him. Um, and it, he, basically, what happens is he, you know, he is in the in the war, World War World World War Two, uh, and is eventually captured. Um, but really, this again, this thing that shines through all these things that happens to him is that. He could care less what is going on. It seems like he could literally care less whether he died in the next moment. And uh, um, again, that's a kind of a prevailing thing that he just, uh, life is meaningless. Um, what does any of it matter? And you really do get this kind of apathetic sort of view, uh, this view of Billy as though he's extremely apathetic, could care less what happens. Um, but in general, the book, again, details Billy Pilgrim and his um crappy the crappy things that happened throughout his existence you know again he's involved in world war ii he's captured um somehow doesn't die like numerous times and i'll chronicle those here in a little bit but um and then of course there's this whole idea of space travel uh it's time and space travel which is prominent throughout the book right billy has this ability or so he says or so we're thought to believe who really knows um he has this alleged ability to travel through space and time you know he goes through this oh i should have written it down i have their names here somewhere termophador is basically this other planet so he's a, a supposedly captured by these aliens from time to time and they're like take him to this other planet and uh he sort of learns about sort of their way of existence they have like these five senses the fourth dimension so on and so forth but um you know, and I guess a lot of, I was so confused by this book in some sense when I put it down at the end, um, I had to go and sort of do a lot of research, which I don't usually do after I read a novel. Like, what actually is going on here? Um, you know, and, and does this, is this actually happening? Is it, is it portrayed as if, as if it's actually happening? Does, you know, is this really happening? Is Billy really going here? Or is this like, is he just in an asylum, a mental institute? with all this going on in his head. To me, it's not entirely clear in, at all, ever. Um, as I was mentioning the research, though, it seems like everyone just takes it, at, most other people who read the book, take it just as at face value that, um, you know, he really does think and, you know, go to this other planet, Tramalfador or whatever. The narrator, that's a whole nother issue, 
the narrator who writes book one and book or chapter one and chapter ten, he says oh, for the most part everything is true or that what happens happened. Um, but did it? Because then you get all these weird sort of questions thrown into the mix, right? So does he really? Right. A lot of this again is this centered around this idea that Billy is going from one point in time to the next and then back and then also being uh, abducted by these aliens, you know, at various points in time. Um, but is that really happening? Uh, and that, I guess, mirrors a larger theme that underlies this and what's reality in general. But um, are we supposed to take that general story, at, you know, at face value um, or not? I mean, because there's several things that are said throughout the novel that make me question that and question you know, what Vonnegut's true intentions were, or what he really had in mind in terms of what was going on with Pilgrim, right? I mean, after all, he voluntarily submits himself to a mental uh, hospital, right? So he's got issues, he's got things going on. Um, so maybe this is just a reflection of underlying, you know, mental issues, right? He sees and thinks things that aren't really happening. Right? Maybe that's the case. Um, so, for example, so page 127 is where he... He uh, submits himself, and then uh, you know, not only does he submit himself to this, you know, this health, mental health and, um, hospital. You know, there's all sorts of uh, points throughout the novel where it, it seems to be suggested that he's traveling in time when he's dreaming. So is it just, you know, is that when it's happening, and not it's not really happening? Uh, but anyway, going back to um, when he submits himself, so he admit, admits himself to the asylum essentially um he's describing everyone there they had come here or the narrator is they had they'd come here voluntarily this is page 127 they had come here voluntarily alarmed by the outside world billy had committed himself in the middle of his final year at the ilium school of optometry nobody else suspected that he was going crazy everybody else thought he looked fine and was acting fine now he was in the hospital the doctors agreed he was going crazy so he admits himself to this insane asylum i guess um but then you know so so are we supposed to take then all these appeals to traveling through time space as if you know that's really happening or then are we supposed to take this you know this notion that he admitted himself to the mental health inst institution as a sign that maybe this is going on in his head like what is what were what were vonnegut's true intentions i don't know um as i mentioned as well though there's you know, there's all sorts of things associated with Billy and his sleep, too. Um, there's lots of, like, suggestions that maybe this time and space travel is really going on just in his sleep. Uh, and there's also this um, scene where they, him and a lot of the other prisoners of war are sleeping in, like, I think these box cars, and they're in tight, confined spaces, and nobody wants to sleep next to Billy because he's, like, so violent in his sleep. He, like, lashes out and so on. So, you just get this image throughout the novel that sleep is very um, is sort of a significant factor for Billy in some regard, and so I wonder, you know, is that maybe is his time and space travel? Is that really just again a reflection of what's going on in his dreams? So some sort of textual evidence to I guess back that up, if you will. Um, so I was describing that scene where they are all like kind of packed in tight, trying to get sleep. Um, someone says, you yell, you kick. And Billy says, I do. And so they're all saying, yeah, nobody wants to sleep next to you. Uh, nearly everybody seemingly had an atrocity story of something Billy Pilgrim had done to him in his sleep. Everybody told Billy Pilgrim to keep the hell away. And so that was, those were uh, taken from 99 and 100, pages 99 and 100. Um, and so uh, sort of, again, uh, another scene that might support this idea that really all this is going on in his sleep or in his dreams. So when he's on this, when he's abducted by the aliens and taken to this planet, Tramalfador, spoilers, spoilers throughout this, by the way, um, he is mated with a porn actress, um, like in a zoo, what is essentially a zoo on this other planet, where then all the Tramalfadorians watch Billy and this porn actress from Earth mate um, the porn actress, is, his name is Montana something or other, Montana Wild Hack. Um, but, you know, okay, so that's sort of the general idea that's built up. But 
Then you have scenes like this. Um, he wakes up. This is pages 170 to 171. He wakes up. Um, he traveled from, in time from that delightful bed to bed in 1968. So now he's, it was his bed in Ilium. So now he's back to reality or Earth, you know, his hometown or his town of Ilium, New York, uh, where he resides. So he's there. And he had, when he woke up, you know, he, it says page 171, Billy sniffed. His hot bed smelled like a mushroom cellar. He had had a wet dream about Montana wild hack. So is, again, is all this going on just in his sleep, right? Um, so, you know, he's supposedly mating with this porn actress on this Tromopador or other planet, but maybe it's just, um, again, a fantasy. He's dreaming, right, um, when he's sleeping. Um, page 200, we have further evidence. So... Uh, this is when he was, I believe this is right after, so he is in a plane crash and only him and one other person survives. And, you know, this is, he's obviously out for a long time. A lot of, you know, he's in the hospital for a long time. And this is page 200. Quote, a famous brain surgeon came up from Boston and operated on him for three hours. Billy was unconscious for two days after that, and he dreamed millions of things, some of them true. The true things were time travel. So he dreamed time travel. Of course, then it's intimated that it was true. So, I, you know, what do we make of this? What is really going on? Again, one of the ultimate upshots that I took from the book is what what is going on? I don't I don't know. And maybe that's the underlying thing that there is no ultimate meaning to anything. And he wanted to Vonnegut that is wanted to have that shine through in the work itself by, um, you know, having basically these kind of just segments of this reality for this character presented in a disjointed fashion with, in my, in my mind, no uh, overarching sense of unity or resolution, ultimately. I, um, but again, maybe that was the point. Life doesn't have any ultimate meaning. There's nothing, there's no underlying theme to take away from it, right? That's one of the themes throughout this, and maybe that's the upshot of the novel itself. Um, anyway, uh, confusion, right, is what led to that little aside there. My general confusion after reading the book, that is. Uh, more on that later, though. Um, I also thought it was interesting that, so he becomes a fan of this this guy named Kilgore Trout, who's a science fiction writer. Um, of course, we have reasons to question whether he actually exists within the book as well. Um, I'll get to that later. But So Kilgore Trout writes these science fiction books that mesmerize Billy, and he becomes a big fan of them. Um, but I thought it was weird, too, that one of Kilgore's own books, so this science fiction dude, one of his own books basically mirrors what happens to Billy Pilgrim. And the whole, this basically is the synopsis for this book. Um, so it says, so this, so the name of the book uh, by this Kilgore Trout was called The Big Board. And it says, so this is from 257, quote, it was about an earthling man and woman who were kidnapped by extraterrestrials. They were put on display in a zoo on a planet called Xericon 212. Well, that's exactly more or less, change the name of the planet. That's exactly what supposedly happens to Billy Pilgrim in Slaughterhouse 5. Um, so was that supposed to say something? Does that mean anything? Uh, did Billy just have this play out because he read it already? In a, you know, right? Does he think he's doing this because he was sort of influenced by the science fiction book that he read? Who knows? Um, so... Some prevalent themes here, I've already hinted at some of them here, you know, what are some of the prevalent themes throughout the book? What is reality itself? What's really going on? Um, you know, uh, what's really going on for Billy is, you know, after all, is this, uh, is he really going to this other planet called Tramalfador? Or are we supposed to take these, you know, these textual hints that I've offered as suggesting maybe that um, all that's really just a reflection of his dreaming life or um, some sort of mental illness that underlies his experience. Um, who knows? And so that is kind of an underlying thing of the book itself. You know, what is reality ultimately? Um, another really dominant theme and one that the book is um, really known for. And again, one of the things that drew me to it was, it, you know, that's sort of questioning of our traditional sense of time. Right, and you get this idea that time's not linear, but rather you get a lot of um, uh, sort of metaphors where time is compared to like a mountainscape, right? Where the Tramalfadorians, they don't have our typical linear 
view of time where you have one moment that then is followed by the next, which is followed by the next, and the sense of causation and so on. But rather, they see all of time as always present and interconnected. It's hard to describe, given that I have the former view of time, typically, right? But it's so, so their view is often throughout the novel compared to like viewing a mountainscape and how you can, so that I, I think the idea is just as when viewing a mountainscape, you can highlight and, and pick out any particular mountain peak, right? So to their, their view of time, you can highlight or pick out any particular moment at any particular moment, right? You can, so they're all always accessible, right? All, every moment of time. So I guess even to talk about moments is kind of weird, but you get the sense that again, time's not linear like we typically think of it. And it's somehow like a mountain range. Um, you constantly get that kind of allegory, if you will, or a metaphor. Um, so some, some quotes from the book to kind of um, capture that idea. So um, this is one of the Tremolphodorians talking to Billy at one point. So this is page 109. I'm a Tremolphodorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warnings or explanation. It simply is. Take it moment by moment. And you will find that we're all, as I've said before, bugs and amber. Uh, 112, another. So, also describing the Tremalfaldorian's sense of time. So, I, get, I think this, um, so yeah, this is another uh, Tremalfaldorian describing things to Billy with respect to time. Quote, there is no beginning, no middle, no end, no suspense, no moral, no causes, no effects. Uh, oh, sorry, he's describing the books for the Tremolphodorians. What we love in our books are the depths of many marvelous moments seen all at one time. So you get that, again, that sense that you can, every moment of time, if you will, is equally always accessible, ever present, right? And the, the sense that the past never really dies because um, it will always live on, if you will, and ever, uh, every new moment in the sense that we still remember the past and keep it alive, right? Um, I think that's kind of the sentiment here anyway. So the, that so the idea is again the, the moments are like always present um, and in some sense then death is minimized. You you get that sentiment throughout the book um, that you know don't worry about death. That um, death is is really um, sort of illusory and not something that should be feared uh, in in some sense because again we're still always ever present no matter what and we will always live on in some sense through memories and, and, and the like, if you will. So some uh, passages from the, the novel that sort of highlight that. Let's see, here we go. The most important thing, and this is pages 33 to 34. The most important thing I learned on Tremalfador was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He is still very much alive in the past. So it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future, always have existed, always will exist. Okay. When a Tremalfadorian, actually, I'm going to keep reading here. The Tremalfadorians can look at all the different moments just the way we can look at a stretch of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. They can see how permanent all the moments are, and they can look at any moment that interests them. It is just an illusion we have here on Earth that one moment follows another one like beads on a string, and that once a moment is gone, it is gone forever. So that's, that's an illusion. <clears throat> when a Tremolphodorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is that the dead person is in a bad condition in that particular moment, but that the same person is just, just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I myself hear that somebody is dead, I simply shrug and say that the Tremolphodorians, what the Tremolphodorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes. Speaking of which, that is literally said like over a hundred times throughout the novel so it goes and it's usually said like when there's death or something bad happening um, rather than sort of get into all the gory details and this sort of wraps it up and says so it goes and moves on which i guess i appreciate um page 172 so this was that's right this one um this was when, so Billy is an optometrist, and so he's like, uh, has a, a little boy that's a patient, he's working with the little boy, and the little boy, I guess, 
his father died. I don't remember the sp specifics, but um, so this is Billy working with the little boy. And so again, this is page 172. While he examined the boy's eyes, Billy told him matter-of-factly about his adventures on Tralfamador. Tra I don't know how to actually say that. Assured the fatherless boy that his father was very much alive, still in moments the boy would see again and again. Isn't that comforting? Billy asked. And somewhere in there, the boy's mother went out and told the receptionist, receptionist that Billy was evidently going crazy. So, again, who, who knows what's really going on? But he's, again, trying to relate to this boy that your, boy, your dad, he might, he just seems to be dead, but he's never really going to die in the sense that he lives on forever through you and through your memories of him. So interesting, again, sort of point to page 269 will be the last reference I make with respect to this point. So if, uh, again, page 269, the, the implication seems to be that Billy learns we're immortal. If what Billy Pilgrim learned from the Trophilomadorians is true, that we'll, we'll all live forever, no matter how dead we may sometimes seem to be. Right? And so this is actually the narrator in the last chapter, chapter 10 reflecting back on things and so he's mentioning referencing billy pilgrim and you know if what he learned from the trump dorians is true that we live forever so you get the sense that death is in general themed right the sense that death is illusory that in some way we're immortal whether that i don't know it, it, in what sense um in particular um I, I try to relay that sense in which and through our memories right and through other people's memories we will live on Okay, but once one way or another, the idea is that um, time itself is illusory, as is the idea of our death, right? That um, we're in some sense immortal. That is, again, a prevalent theme throughout this. You also get another theme that, um, and I knew about this going into the book. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned, I think, uh, on the Wikipedia article, for example, is that it gets into predestination or free will, right? Are we, is everything determined? Um, you know, or or do we have some semblance of freedom? And he definitely, I, I guess this is probably Vonnegut's view in general, but, you know, the theme seems to be that, um, no, there is no free will. So, and actually there's a famous discussion in here, which I, I saw referenced in the Wikipedia article, and then in research afterwards, you constantly see it come up um, when people reference that this is, you know, gets into the idea of free will. This is one of the famous passages. So Billy's talking with the Tremalfadorians, um, and he said to them, this is page 109, you sound to me as though you don't believe in free will, said Billy Pilgrim. And then it goes on to the response of the Tremalfadorian. If I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, said the Tremalfadorian, I wouldn't have any idea of what was meant by free will. I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe, and I have studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will. So the implication is, again, that um, we're the only ones who like to convince ourselves that we have any control, if you will, over what's happening, right? Any freedom. Okay. And so alternatively, the implication is, right, that everything's predetermined, um, right? So there is this, I guess, one of the upshots then, and you also get this with Billy and, you know, some of the other characters, is that why fret about anything then, right? Whatever happens is going to happen. So it, so it goes, right? You know, move on. Um, so I guess one of the upshots is it doesn't have to be, just as an aside, it doesn't have to be like this bleak thing, right, that we have no free will. Maybe it's just, um, can be sort of freeing in the sense that you don't have to worry about being responsible for what's happening anymore, right? Um, whatever happens, well, is going to happen anyway, so, so let it be, right? Um, that can be kind of freeing, I think, and you kind of see it in some of the attitudes of the characters, right, that embrace this Predeter um, predeterminism or fatalism in some sense, right? They, they, they're free in some sense that they, they don't seem too bogged down by the, you know, what transpires, especially the ills that they're facing. You know, take Billy for a perfect example there. You know, he faces death countless times. Crap happens to him throughout, and so it goes, right? He just moves along. Um, so it goes, I mentioned, right, many times at this point said uh the wikipedia article actually cites the exact number of times that it said and i underlined every single time that i at least that it, it consciously registered i underlined every time it happened it was a lot it's like over literally over 100 times he says so it goes um and you get this general sense of apathy fatalism and meaninglessness throughout the novel i mean throughout so 
let's get a, a, a real sense of that. So fatalism here, page 77, quote, among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future, end quote. Page 128, again, the sense that life is meaningless. Quote, Rosewater was twice as smart, and by the way, Rosewater is this character um, that Billy encounters in the hospital that, that introduces him to this Kilgore Trout, this science fiction author. Rosewater was twice as smart as Billy, but he and Billy were dealing with similar crises, crises in similar ways. They had both found life meaningless, partly, partly because of what they had seen in war. Right? So again, this sense that constant reminder that life seems meaningless. Um, page 130, a couple pages later. This is Billy's mom. He's sort of their, uh, the narrators reflecting on Billy's mom. She upset Billy simply by, simply by being his mother. She made him feel embarrassed and ungrateful and weak because she had gone to so much trouble to give him life and to keep that life going. And Billy didn't really like life at all. Right? So sense of meaninglessness, apathy, who cares what happens. Um, 149, page 149, again, fatalism, this idea that everything that's going to happen is going to happen, right? Whatever happens was going to happen from the get-go. If you knew, if you know this, said Billy, isn't there some way you can prevent it? Can't you keep the pilot from pressing the button? So the Tromopladorians were talking to him about how they figured out, you know, they they realized the, how the universe is going to end and so on. And Billy's saying, well, why can't you, can't you stop it? You know, can't you press this button that would stop it? He has always pressed it and he always will. We always let him and we always will let him. The moment is structured that way. Or sorry, can, can you keep him from pressing the button? And they're just saying, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen, basically. Uh, that was, again, page 149. Page 243, another instance, speaks to the negligibility of death and the true nature of time. So, uh, when people are starting to worry about him, uh, Billy, that is, uh, you know, the narrator then speaks to what's going on really inside Billy's mind. Actually, so this is from 243. Actually, Billy's outward listlessness was a screen. The listlessness concealed a mind which is, was fizzing and flashing thrillingly. It was preparing letters and lectures about the flying saucers, the negligibility of death, and the true nature of time. Okay, so, uh, again, hopefully there's giving you kind of a sense of the uh, attitude, the general attitude towards life and um, what what ha in existence in general and what happens. Page 254 again, it's sort of fatalism. Uh, this is Billy talking. It was all right, said Billy. Everything is all right. And everybody has to do exactly what he does. I learned that on Trophimador. Right? So we have to do what we're going to do. It's, you know, it was already meant to be. It's going, going to happen anyway. That's, that's fatalism, the idea of fatalism. Um, there's also, I don't, I couldn't find the exact moment. This is referenced in a lot of the, you know, the research that if you look into, you know, what people have to say about this book and other reviews and so on, a lot of people will reference this part, but I couldn't actually go back and find it. Um, so like Billy's or not Billy, I think this is the narrator actually talking about how he's going to write this book and it's going to be anti-war and so on. And speaking again to this idea of, well, people are going to be people. What's going to happen is going to happen. Somebody says to him, so, you know, he's saying, I'm going to write an anti-war book. Well, and they're, they're like, well, you might as well write an anti-glacier book, right? I mean, because this is just nature and this is what's naturally going to happen. Um, you know, why don't you just write an anti-nature book or, you know, an anti-rainbow book or an anti-rain book or whatever, right? Any part of nature that whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Just write a book about any aspect of that, right? Why are you picking war as if we can do anything about it, as if we can change our situation? as if it's not going to inevitably happen anyway, right? That's the implication anyway. Another uh, sort of theme or thing that I caught on to is um, he'll do lots of little tricks like um, sort of certain things are repeated, which I, I, I like. Um, so like you get references, and I, only, I know this happened multiple times, but I actually only, as I was going back through and looking for things, I only found it once, but somewhere a big dog barked. Is on page 214. That's said numerous times. This reference to a big dog barking somewhere. So I thought, thought that's kind of funny. Um, and then like this, how did I get so old? The sentiment of like people, 
you know, aging super fast and, you know, I knew crap was going to happen, but how did I get this old, right? This idea of just, you know, age sneaking up on us, that happens repeatedly. And I can only find two spots, but again, that's something that happens um, constantly throughout. So page 56 was one of them. Um, so Billy's talking to somebody and they say, how did I get so old? I mean, they literally, they literally say that. And then 242 was not the other spot where I explicitly found it. Um, excuse me, he said to Billy. This is again page 242. Then he did it again. Oh God, he said. I knew it was going to be bad getting old. He shook his head. I didn't know it was going to be this bad, right? So it's like this constant reminder of this idea of age sneaking up on us and it being, you know, this bad thing. Uh, but on the flip side, you get sort of the contrast, I guess, would be the Tremolfadorians, or however you're supposed to say their name, and then Billy as well, sort of constantly accentuating the opposite idea that, you know, maybe age is an illusion and that death is really not something we should, that we should be bemoaning, right? That um, it's not that bad. Okay, so also wanted to mention how I was really reminded of, I mentioned how Billy Pilgrim strikes me as this quintessential like anti-hero not a traditional hero who's strong and courageous, but rather the exact opposite, right? Meek, um, he barely gets by, and it's through no concerted effort of his own. He's always getting lucky, if you will. Um, constantly reminded, actually, one of my, probably, and I haven't read it in a long time. I actually have several copies of it. Um, Catch-22. Um, I, I For a long time, I said it was my favorite novel. I haven't read it. Um, recently enough to to want to commit myself to that right now, but love this book. Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Yosarian's the main character in um, this book. Actually, now I've got like this desire to maybe go back and read this again, but um, really reminded me a lot of you know the, the characters and this, these anti-heroes. That one, and then the one I read even more recently, my wife and I both read this one, and I want to say in the last five years. Um, Ignatius, I think that's how you say his name, Ignatius, another um, penultimate uh, anti-hero. You just look at the, the cover, right? Um, great, another great book. Both of these are awesome books, some of my all-time favorites. Um, was reminded of these books in the writing style and specifically as well the characters and how they're, again, these quintessential examples of the anti-hero who they're just kind of... <laughs> blustering you know they you know ignatius doesn't know what he's doing he's a blundering idiot um you know how did how he gets by at all is a miracle and it's largely in part thanks to his mother you know mom's always there for us right um but just again same thing with billy he's constantly escaping death as i intimated before through no concerted effort of his own right if it wasn't for others or you know, happenstance and luck, you know, he could have, he would have died several times throughout, um, but he just gets lucky, um, and has others for whatever reason there for him to, even though he doesn't, he doesn't seem to want or care to continue to exist, uh, he, they, they, they still kind of string him along, pull him along, it seems like, um, so for example, right off the bat, now, I shouldn't, I should have stressed this to begin with, the thing that really stands out about this book is that it's completely disjointed, right? It's, I, I know I fleetingly mentioned it, but it's bounces around chronologically. It's not written in chronological order, right? It's moment to moment. It goes back and forth from all these different points in time. So chronologically, you know, if you start in his Billy Pilgrim's life chrono chronologically towards the beginning, but in the book, it's actually page 55. So not actually at the beginning, right? Um, but his, so when he's young, his dad is going to teach him to swim. And the way he's going to do it is just going to toss him in the deep end and he's going to have to sink or swim, figure it out. Well, rather than like try to swim, Billy just closes his eyes and, you know, he has to be saved by somebody else. Doesn't even attempt to try to swim or escape. And this is when he's extremely young. So it's not, this is one of the things I was thinking about in preparing for this. It, it's not as if the war itself is significantly responsible for his attitude. It, even as a child, he seemed to have this ho-hum, apathetic, you know, um, um, attitude or disposition towards, towards life. 
So page 55 describes that scene. Uh, Billy was numb as his father carried him from the shower room to the pool. His eyes were closed. When he opened his eyes, he was on the bottom of the pool, and there was beautiful music everywhere. He lost consciousness, but the music went on. He dimly sensed that somebody was rescuing him. Billy resented that. And so that's the end of that, that segment. Um, so, you know, very early on, Ro Roland Weary is like this antagonist for Billy. He, uh, there's a, uh, a segment of their, you know, they're fighting along, alongside each other in the war and they're trying to escape capture. Um, those two and then two scouts, these four are with each other trying to escape capture for a lot of the book and Weary hates and bullies um, this meek, uh, uh, you know, ho-hum Billy. He just starts bullying him, hating him. Um, and he's ultimately responsible for Billy's death in the end. But he, he even saves him, though, at one point when Billy could care less. Just go on without me, he literally says at various points throughout his life. Uh, but Weary drags him along, saves him. Okay, and he says, quote, here he is, boy, said Weary. He don't want to live, but he's going to live anyway. So, you know, if it wasn't for these other people saving him from the pool, saving him in the war, you know, Billy would have died again a long time ago. Um, they're captured by, so right after, this is kind of funny, right after Weary saves him, he gets so ticked at Billy that he actually is about to just lay into him, just kick him right where it counts, like, and probably kill Billy. But just as that's about to happen, the Germans actually capture him. So this is page 65. Weary drew back his right boot, aimed a kick at the spine, at the tube which had so many of Billy's important wires in it. Weary was going to break that tube. But then Weary saw that he had an audience. Five German soldiers and a police dog on a leash were looking down into the bed of the creek. So once again, Billy saved, this time from his former savior, um, Weary. Um, by the, the Germans who then capture them. Uh, and finally, you know, note that, you know, Slaughterhouse Five itself, right? He escapes the bombing of Dresden, which really the whole, in many ways, the book's about, right? This, the atrocity of the bombing of Dresden, um, which I read in subsequent research that the reports that Vonnegut was working with in writing this were um, inaccurate in terms of the, the death toll and so on, not to minimize the bombing, but um, but it was, you know, he presumed it was much worse than it actually was for, for what, what it's worth. But, you know, Billy is then, so they're captured and the only way he survives, he's in Dresden, the only way he survives is that he's in the deep re recesses of this, this former slaughterhouse, Slaughterhouse 5, it's numbered with a 5. So if it wasn't for being held captive in there, in, in these recesses of the slaughterhouse, he would have been killed like seemingly everyone else in the city was. Um, so he's saved, uh, again, by chance because he happens to be in this slaughterhouse. But, and then even then, even, even then, so they, these few people are saved, these prisoners of war are saved because they're in the slaughterhouse and they're kind of escape, you know, coming out. And then these fighter pilots circled around us to try to find people that were still, you know, maybe alive. And so they start shooting because they see Billy and these other people start shooting at him and he still survives. So this is page 230. American fighter, pl fighter planes came in under the smoke to see if anything was moving. They saw Billy and the rest moving down there. The planes sprayed them with machine gun bullets, but the bullets missed. Then they saw some other people moving down by the riverside and they shot at them. They hit some of them. So it goes. So somehow he, he even survives that. Um, so interesting book. I mean, so what are, what are my thoughts, you know, in general, you know, interesting book, no doubt about it. Again, I was reminded, this should be somewhat telling, uh, that, that this book I did find appealing in some regards, you know, it should be telling that I, I was reminded of some of my favorite novels of all time. Um, so I think that is a plus obviously for Vonnegut, um, in this book in some respect. Um, I liked that it, it, obviously I'm a philosopher. I had mentioned that in episode zero, what's going to appeal to me, the philosophical nature of a lot of this stuff, right? Even in novels. And I, that's what drew, drew me to it, right? was this, you know, these unique um, perspectives of death and time that, that are offered in this book. Um, however, one thing I, and I, I suggested this earlier. One thing I would say is that you don't get the depth, right? 
in this novel, right? You don't get in terms of its treatment of these, you know, unique views of time and death and so on. So compare it with I have Hess, Herman Hesse's. I don't know how to say his name technically, but so you know, I was so in my mind when I was thinking about this point, I was um, Aldous Huxley is another one. I should have grabbed some of his books. Um, so you read like Huxley and Hesse, you know, at least I haven't read them, you know, uh, recently, but this is again what I recall. You not only do they sort of touch on some of the topics and these unique, interesting views, but then they go into them and much more substantively, right? Um, you know, into like defending certain, you know, views or positions, right? Or at least exploring them with more depth. Whereas this just treats it, I wouldn't, I think superficial is too like a derogatory term, but kind of in a more superficial manner or just it, it, it alludes to these topics, but then it doesn't dive deep into them or explore them with any depth. And so I, I say that, but I do want to mention, I don't think that's, and I think I alluded to this earlier, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for. Uh, after all, I, I don't want to read something that's super heavy in philosophy all the time. That's why I go to novels sometimes, right? And so, and conversely, one of the things I would definitely say about this is it reads super fast. I don't remember the last time I read, I literally read this in like two or three days with lots of other stuff going on, you know, I have four kids at home all, all day with us, you know, right now. And so lots of stuff going on and I still read this in two, three days. So it, it reads super quick. And that might be a reflection of the fact that it doesn't go dive too deep into some of the issues uh, as opposed to say, you know, Siddhartha or some of these other books by Hesse or Aldous Huxley's works, you know, they might take a little bit longer to um, sort of sift through because they do, there's a little bit more meat to what's going on. So hopefully that comes across uh, in a meaningful manner. So I, I wanted to, for better or worse, just point that out. That was, again, my reflection. It doesn't have that deep sort of treatment of the topics. It does allude to them, which I appreciate alludes to these, you know, interesting views of time and so on, but it doesn't explore them with any significant depth. So that could be a plus or a minus, right? So if you are looking for something a little bit deeper, maybe go to Hesse or Huxley or something like that. But, you know, and I have, sometimes I want that, but sometimes I want to just, you know, fly through a book and, you know, and enjoy, you know, reading, reading it um, and not exploring, you know, something too deep. And so that would be where I would turn more to Vonnegut. Um, and I don't know, maybe others would disagree with that. One thing I, after doing research and checking out some other reviews of this book after reading it, um, one of the things I took away was that maybe I'm missing something um, because I definitely seem to be in the minority. This is a, you know, regarded to, uh, regarded as a classic. Other, you know, I couldn't, I don't even remember coming across a negative review and I didn't read a ton of reviews, don't get me wrong, but most people are, you know, they view this very you know, favorably. So, um, so, so maybe some people would argue, for example, with this idea that it it's, offers a, a shallower treatment of some of the philosophical topics it brings up. Um, just like maybe some people will say that they don't have as big of a problem with this lack of a resolution or sense of unifying thing going on. Um, but that's one of the things I'll mention and reiterate here in a moment that bothered me about it. Um, but I, I guess the point right now I'm raising is just that um, I do seem to be alone in sort of I feel like some of my reactions, and so maybe I again just missed the boat in some regard. Maybe I need to go back and reread re it. I don't, I don't know. Um, anyway, so I mentioned how again that lack of depth, so to speak. Uh, not uh, he still references it, so don't don't get the wrong idea, right? I mean, it's deeper in the sense that he's treating you know philosophical issues of time and space and um, death and and so on, whereas a lot of novels don't even go there, right? So um, again, it's, it's deeper than some novels, but it's not super deep. And again, maybe that it works in its favor in some respects, because I flew through this book, as I mentioned, right? I, it reads incredibly fast and I didn't want to put it down. Uh, so I've kind of been suggesting how I've, one of the things I took away from it was this lack that something was missing. Like I, I didn't seem fulfilled, but, um, and that sort of started happening about half, um, halfway through, it sort of started seeming like, is this, this kind of seems disjointed. Um, what is really happening? What's the ultimate gig here? What's, what's really going on? Um, but I never once wanted to like, you know, I never stopped reading. I guess the point here is that 
it reads fast and then I never wanted to put it down. I, I flew through it. Even when it's I, like halfway through, I started having those sentiments. I still kept reading just as fast and couldn't put it down. So I got a lot of, I guess, a lot of positives and some negatives here. I enjoyed one of the things that a lot of people comment. And so I think it was 1969 he wrote this. So a lot's changed since then. You know, um, I've read a lot of books, you know, since then, a lot of, you know, authors since then have probably been inspired by him and mimicked it. So it's not as novel to me, but I, I do like the experimental sort of nature of the novel. How, as I mentioned, it's, it's not presented in a chronological nature. Um, I, I, I've alluded in other episodes how, you know, I've written novels myself, um, three and a half, basically completed three. And, you know, some of my own stuff, it's it experiments in that kind of, kind of way. And so that resonates with me. I, um, I enjoy that sort of thing. But on the other hand, maybe that's one of the things that made it difficult to sort of grasp ultimately what the heck was happening. Um, so I guess that's positive and negative. It, uh, I do, I love, you know, novel things and exploring new ways of doing things. So I will always give an author that's doing something new a chance. And so kudos to Vonnegut, especially at that time period, 1969, right? That probably wasn't happening too much. So um, I do think that's worth pointing out. But again, I wonder how much that sort of disjointed nature of the text then led to some of my issues with, you know, scratching my head at the end and wondering what the heck it really happened. What am I supposed to be taking away from this book? Um, so I guess I wanted to say a little bit more about a couple of those issues I had, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up here. So um, again, I felt like the book had no sense of resolution. Maybe this was Vonnegut's point. I don't know, because again, one of the, the underlying themes of the novel was life seems meaningless. Um, there's no underlying meaning. It's a ho-hum existence. Who cares what happens? It's going to happen anyway. Um, so maybe that was the point, but I certainly didn't feel like there was any kind of resolution. <sighs> My wife even commented how I was really, really seemed bothered by it because after I finished, we were watching a, a show or something. I was looking stuff up, trying to research, like, you know, what am I missing? Like, what, um, what am I supposed to be taking away from it? Um, and I think it's just... Maybe it is just supposed to be, again, this accounting of a random person, right, uh, who's a, extremely fatalistic and apathetic, um, sort of a disjointed picture of their existence, um, and nothing more, nothing less. I don't know, I feel like I, I have that in other books, though, like um, just this kind of random narration of some guy's uh, events. And again, I know that the people are huge fans of this, and so I'm probably not giving it due justice and uh but this is just how I felt though coming out of it um uh one of the other issues I had like who, the narrator like so he, the narrator writes the first and tenth tenth chapters and then the second through ninth are him giving an account of Billy Pilgrim right and but who is the narrator I don't know um it is written in the first person I right so every other person who I looked into, you know, the reviews, the research, and so on, just assumes it seems assume that it's Vonnegut. I don't know if Vonnegut. I, you know, maybe at some point I'll look into what Vonnegut himself has said about Slaughterhouse Five. Maybe all these issues will be resolved if I just did that. Maybe Vonnegut comes out and says, "Yes, I intended to be the narrator. I am the narrator." But I think everybody else, or maybe I, I don't know whether this is the case. Are they just assuming that because the whoever's writing it says I? that that then is the author of the book itself. I, anyway, it never seemed to, to be explicitly made this connection that Vonnegut is taken to be the narrator, to me. Um, and I would have only made that connection, you know, I wouldn't have made that connection necessarily unless you know, I did the research and looked into it and saw that everyone else was just assuming that it was Vonnegut. So that was, you know, one thing that I found puzzling is, who is this narrator? How are they related um, to Billy Pilgrim? And you, so other than like the first and 10th chapters, you get just fleeting references like I was there. So whoever this narrator is, they were along with Pilgrim, you know, during some of these events. Um, so like, for example, page 160, and I know there's a couple, probably a couple more. It doesn't happen that often though. The narrator really doesn't interject him or herself, um, himself into the uh, novel, except for the first and 10th chapters, which are written entirely by the narrator other than these few instances. So I wanna say maybe like a handful of times, five times at most. I've got a couple instances here. So page 160, an American near Billy, yada, yada, yada. There they go, meant his brains. That was I, that was me. That was the author of this book. So 
referencing someone, you know, what happened to them in this event, saying that that was me, the, the author. I don't know why I'm pointing at myself, but that was the author of the book, the narrator. Page 189, you get something similar. Somebody behind him in the boxcar said, Oz, that was I, that was me. The only other city I'd ever seen was Indianapolis, Indiana. So you get little pieces like that. That was I, that was me. And it's usually put just like that. But otherwise, it's like, who is this narrator? And you know he's writing this anti-war book and so on and so forth. And so, again, I guess the scholars and all the researchers probably write that it's just supposed to be Vonnegut himself. And it, it does... Like, uh, I guess, you know, I, I learned a little bit about Vonnegut himself in doing some of this research, and it does seem to mirror, like, you know, his, what, what happens to him, Vonnegut himself, biographically, right? Um, in terms of, you know, for example, going to the University of Chicago and these different things that happen to the narrator also happen to Vonnegut. So I just, I guess the, my takeaway was it wasn't super explicit, right, what, you know, who the narrator was, at least in the novel itself. You know, but I, I guess it's meant to be, or it is Vonnegut. Um, but again, just my ultimate upshot is, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be taking from this book or what ultimately is the, yeah, what I'm supposed to be taking from it or whatever the, what it was the over, overarching point. Um, not to suggest everything has to have a point. And I guess maybe that is his point is that it doesn't have a point. Like I said earlier, I don't know, but um, what is ultimately happening? I, I don't know. And what am I supposed to take away from it? But then also, what is actually ultimately happening in the book? I suggested all the ways earlier that I don't even know, right, what, what we're supposed to take away from it ultimately as actually was happening, right? Did, did Billy really go and visit these other planets? Or uh, was it happening, in, you know, just in his head because he's got all these mental illnesses? Or was he dreaming it? Uh, again, in the chapter one, you get the narrator saying, all this is more or less true. And then other places you get the time travel is true. Um, but what exactly really is happening? And then I mentioned that even you even get, um, uh, you know, the Kilgore Trout, you even get some, so this science fiction writer that Billy becomes enamored with, you even get like some question on whether or not he even exists. Uh, page 141, Rosewater, the guy that, Elliot Rosewater, the guy that introduces Billy to this, you know, this guy and his works, this uh, Kilgore Trout in his science fiction books, he says this. Um, actually, he's talking to Valencia, uh, which is who's Billy's wife. Where does he live? Valencia asks. This is page 141. Nobody knows, Rosewater replied. I'm the only person who, who ever heard of him, as far as I can tell. No two books have the same publisher, and every time I write him and care of a publisher, the letter comes back because the publisher has failed. So, is this dude, does this science fiction writer really exist? I mean, so even that's drawn into question. Like, I don't even know, not only do I, can I not discern ultimately what I'm supposed to be taking away from the book, um, but like what actually even happened in the book? What am I supposed to assume even happened in the book? I don't, I still don't even know that. Um, so I don't know, I again, pluses and minuses here for sure. I guess the last thing I would mention is that I was reminded of Alice in Wonderland uh, very early on in part because of my bewilderment of what was happening and it just seemed kind of kind of ridiculous some of the things that were going on um so page 26 the time would not pass somebody was playing with the clocks there was nothing i could do about it as an earthling i had to believe whatever clocks said and calendars and so on and so forth and there's all, all these things that are said i mean that doesn't give you a good sense of why i would say this but i write what is going on uh, it reminds me, and I say in my notes then, this reminds me of Alice in Wonderland. Is this Alice in Wonderland part two? And what's funny then is later on then, so I write this at that point, you actually get page 50. He references Weary looked like Tweedledum or Tweedledee, who of course are the twins in Alice in Wonderland. And then page 93, remember the, what was it, some potion that Alice drinks in the bottle that said drink me? Somebody, so this is page 93, somebody had stoppered it again. Drink me, it seemed to say. So I just thought that was interesting. Where is it? Oh, come on. Right there. Good grief. Drink me, right? So I thought it was interesting that very early on I had this sort of thought. And then you actually get what seemed to be references to then Alice in Wonderland, for what it's worth. Um, okay, so 
I guess final thoughts uh, and like uh, you know what would I give it for the grade then for a book musing grade. So it's definitely I guess I already did my final thoughts. It's sort of a quick summary. Um, it's an engaging and fast read, which you know as I mentioned. So there's lots of definitely good positives here. Uh, loved his style. Um, mentioned how it reminded me of some of my favorite books of all time, my favorite novels. So obviously that's a great thing if you are being reminded of your favorite novels. Um, lots of potential, but then those, you know, those head scratchers, just a general sense of like, I don't know, dissatisfaction is too strong, but like, I, I felt like I wanted more in the end, like at least some greater sense of some sort of, some semblance of resolution, uh, some sense of satisfaction. I don't know. I just, and again, maybe that was what he was going after. I don't know. Um, but I will say that um, I love the style, extremely accessible, flew through the book again. Um, and if you are one who likes sort of, again, uh, something that's tangentially philosophical, that sort of alludes to, you know, various perspectives on philosophical issues, but then doesn't get bogged down, you might say, in the details, then, hey, this might be right up your alley. Um, and I guess a general sort of, I guess one of the ways I put it in my mind as sort of a, a takeaway was, I think Vonnegut's a great writer. Uh, I, I don't want to sound like a pompous, I guess, in saying this, but he reminds me of myself, actually, in my own writing. I say pompous because, like, obviously he's well regarded, right, as a writer and has all these classics and so on. So, like, comparing myself, with, I, I don't mean to be doing that, but, like, if I was, if someone were to ask me, like, well, what's your writing like? Or what are your novels like? You know, he might be the first, this might be the first person or first one I'd point to, you know, it's similar to, you know, in terms of style. So obviously then I'm going to find, if his style is similar to mine, I'm going to find it appealing, right? Um, love his style. And so one of the ways I sort again, one of the takeaways was, I think I won't, I love the author, but maybe not the book, um, not the particular work. And so I'm actually interested then in, pursuing some of these others and speaking of Alice in Wonderland, there it is. But, you know, checking out some of these others, I think my wife had mentioned she'd read Cat's Cradle and had, she had, it had been a long time, but she had generally favorable impressions of it. Um, so again, maybe that's one way to put it is like, I think he has a lot of potential. <laughs> it sounds so weird. He's written tons of books and he's been he's dead, right? But he has lots of potential for me reading him. I, I think, uh, you know, I, th I think some of these books, you know, could strike a chord, whereas this one maybe is a little disappointing. And I guess I should say as well that maybe some of the disappointment on my end was a result of the hype, because I knew how well regarded this book was. It's probably maybe one of the one he's most well known for, right? Um, how many people have told me, you should read Vonnegut throughout my life. I have had so many people recommend, not necessarily this particular book, but Vonnegut in general. I knew how well regarded it is. I never, you don't hear, I don't anyway hear anybody say, oh, Vonnegut, yeah, I'm not a big fan. You know, everyone I've come across is a fan of Vonnegut, right? Or at least insofar as they have an opinion. So I think maybe that hype had something to do with um, my sense of disappointment in the end, too. Is maybe I just came in expecting too much. Um, anyway, so love the author. Not necessarily the biggest fan of Slaughterhouse-Five in particular. I think, um, you know, I might have more favorable impressions of some of these other works. So what did I give the book? It started off, honestly, I was feeling like a B vibe. And then, like I said, it just felt more and more disjointed. I started feeling more and more like there wasn't anything to ultimately take away from the book. And so uh, I am ultimately going to give it a C, maybe throw on a little plus there, C plus. Um, but uh, again, great, some really great things about the book, but ultimately I can't, um, I can't set aside the sense of um that something was missing that I, I wanted more from the book ultimately so that's that uh a c for kurt monaghan and his slaughterhouse five before i leave i wanted to briefly let you know what might be on tap next so a lot of these i've already referenced in previous um you know the previous episode and even the one before that right so i'm not going to say much about these in particular i will say that this one um, one thing that stood out to me is he was like, I think involved in like an advertising firm and 
making lots of money and so on. And like he quit his career and spent years just devoting himself entirely to writing this book, um, which and gl glancing through and reading little portions of it seems really interesting. So I think this is definitely near the top of the, the list. Still working on um, Jack Alul's uh, The Technological Society. One other one, actually, this is a newer one um, that I'm throwing in the mix. So episode one, I talked about Harry Brown and how I found freedom in an unfree world. And I referenced how similar that was to Ayn Rand to me. And my sister who watched that episode, you know, immediately referenced this particular book by Rand, We the Living, and said how, how influential or at least meaningful it was for her and how good it, of a job as she thought it did to sort of capture what Rand's up to. Um, in less than a thousand pages. Because if you're familiar with Rand, Atlas Shrugged, Fountainhead, those are all extremely long. And I thought this was actually shorter than it was. This one's actually 446 pages itself. So anyway, um, this one comes highly recommended by my sister. So I might be taking a look at this one. We'll see. Um, so those are all possibly on tap. Anyway, that's uh, episode three of Book Musings. Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse 5. Hopefully you enjoyed my musings, and uh, I'll see you for episode four. Thanks.